couple announcements today. Last week we had none. Today we have like a lot. So uh, first one, uh, again, the lookup tour is coming. The Billy Graham um, Association is coming in October, um, October 5th and 6th up in Loveland. Um, this is a free event. You can attend, you can attend this event um, for free. You can go up there and hang out and have a good time. Um, but if you want to serve at this event, they just ask that you go through the Christian Life and Witness course. It's a free course, um, but they just want to make sure that you are prepared to share Jesus with others, others who may not know about him. So, which is our next announcement, that Christian Life and Witness course is coming up. There are training dates in August. Um, these are the dates that are closest to us over there in Longmont and Whitefields. Um, and again, they're free. Um, but if, again, if you want to serve at the festival, uh, they just ask that you go through these courses just two nights, um, and then you'll be all set. If you just want to go and learn how to share about Jesus, um, you can do that too. Again, there's no cost to it. Um, but feel free to uh, go to our website. Um, there's a link for that on the website. You can check out the other dates, other locations, um, if you're interested. So... And then ladies, <laughs> yes, they keep going. Um, there is a Bible study coming for you. So September 11th, uh, Lisa is going to host a Bible study in our home again uh, in, the, in the book of, about the book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, however you want to say it. Um, that's coming up in September, September 11th. Um, sign up for that study is on the table outside in the lobby. Um, but feel free to uh, uh, chat with Lisa about it, um, and she can let you know how to get the book for the study. And then, it just keeps going. Uh, Miner's Day is coming up as well. Um, that is going to be the 22nd, or excuse me, Saturday the 21st of September. Um, we do need help. It's a great opportunity for us to be out in the community and let people know that we're here and let people know why we're here. Um, but we do need help. We need help setting up, uh, tearing down. We need help to um, hold down the tent if it gets really windy. Um, but we do need help to man the booth, to take care of the booth, to hand out goodies, to hand out flyers, to talk to people about the Lord. Um, so please be in prayer about that. And, um, and if the Lord would have you help us um, in that. And then lastly, um, the end of summer barbecue is coming. So that'll be on the 8th of September. That'll be at our house again. Um, just a little potluck. We'll do a little barbecue. We'll provide the burgers and the hot dogs you guys can bring uh, aside to share. Uh, but this year or this time, we're going to do something uh, a little different or we're going to add something. We're going to do a baptism. And you're like, you're going to do a baptism at your house. Absolutely. We're going to have a little inflatable pool. We're going to fill it up with water. And if anybody wants to get baptized, they can get baptized right at our house. So I know there's a couple of folks here that want to get baptized. Um, so we want to take care of that and fulfill that calling and that, um, uh, that worship in our lives. So, all right. Whew. We made it. That was the message for tonight. We're going to worship. No, I'm just teasing. All right. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. And keep in mind, too, with all these announcements, if you are looking for a way to serve, to get involved, to connect, these announcements, these things, these activities are great ways to do that. So it's a great way to fellowship, get connected with each other, but also a great way to help serve the church um, and serve our community. So, again, please be in prayer about that. And please be in prayer, too. We are having technical difficulties. The enemy is abroad. Um, so <laughs> please be in prayer that the enemy would not um, hinder us from hearing God's word tonight. And let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for this time tonight, this time set apart for you and your word, and to praise you, to worship you, and to hear what you have for each and every one of us. Lord, we do pray that the technology would hold out, that the enemy would be bound, 
and that things would go smoothly from here on out. But Lord, whatever happens, it happens, and that's your will. But we are here for you, and so we dedicate this time to you. May you speak to us, may you abide with us as we abide with you. And it's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Judges chapter 15, look at verse 1. It says, After some days at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And verse 3, And Samson said to him, said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do to them, when I do them harm. When I do them harm. The Christian author Philip Yancey writes, Vengeance is a passion to get even. It is a hot desire to give back as much pain as someone gives you. The problem with revenge is that it never gets what it wants. It never evens the score. Fairness never comes. The chain reaction set off by every act of vengeance always takes its unhindered course. It ties both the injured and the injurer to an escalator of pain. Both are stuck on the escalator as long as parity, that desire to make things equal, to settle the score, as long as that desire remains, they are stuck on the escalator. And the escalator never stops, never lets anyone off. Unquote. Tonight in our text, church, we're going to see this escalator, if you will, this path of seeking revenge and the dangers that will come with it and the resulting carnage that will ensue as well. A path I would dare say many of us, if not all of us, have taken as well. Been tempted to take at one time or another, having that raging desire to get even, to retaliate, to punish, to harm another, to hurt another. Why? Because we've been hurt. We've been injured. We've been harmed. You've been wronged. You have experienced pain. You have been hurt. And let me remind all of us that no amount of revenge or vengeance or retaliation is going to fix that. No amount is going to make it right. No amount will make that hurt and the pain go away. And all we are left with is just more pain and more hurt. And some of you have been hurt really bad. Some of you have been injured really bad. I've met people over the years whose child, their son, or their daughter who was murdered. I've seen people who have been abused, people who have lost everything, and you can just see the hurt, you can feel their pain with what they had to go through. But it's that hurt where we find the trailhead to this path. It's your hurt is where this path of vengeance begins, this path of revenge begins. Somebody wronged you, and instead of leaving vengeance to the Lord, because that's what God's Word tells us to do, Romans twelve nineteen says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But instead of leaving it with the Lord, which is easier said than done, but instead of leaving it with the Lord, we decide to take matters into our own hands. And when we do that, we just stepped onto that escalator. We've just begun to go down this path of vengeance. Look at verse 1 again. It says, After some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Samson heads over to Timnah to see his wife, to be with her. He even brings a peace offering. He brings a kid. It's a young goat. But bringing a young goat with him, and men, those listening in, take note here, if you want to make peace with your wife or your spouse after an argument or disagreement, if you mess up and you want to make it right, don't worry about bringing flowers. That's old school. What's new and what's hip these days is you should really bring her a young goat. <laughs> because nothing says I'm sorry and want to make amends than a goat. Don't forget that. Where do you get the goat? I don't know. 
You figure that out. But Samson, but Samson comes back to his wife's house and wants to be with her. But his father-in-law, he tells Samson that she was given to his best man from the wedding. And Samson didn't realize, didn't find that out until now. And can you imagine that? Can you just imagine? This guy shows up expecting to see his bride, and he finds out she's with another man. That would hurt. That would be crushing to hear. The father-in-law thought Samson truly hated his daughter for what she did to him, for her betrayal during the wedding celebration with regards to the riddle. And so her father gave her to another man. Samson's wife was given to another man. And it hurt. And here comes this guy wanting to make peace with his spouse, and he finds out she's with another guy. And it's crushing. It's painful. Ask anyone who has dealt with infidelity, and they will tell you it hurts. And it hurts deep. Crushing the soul, like tearing your heart out kind of hurt. And there is pain, right? Someone wrongs you, steals your identity, gossips about you behind your back, slanders your name behind your back. It doesn't feel very good, does it? It hurts. Getting cut off in traffic. Someone takes your right away. A drunk driver gets in an accident and your loved one is on the other end of it in the hospital. Severely injured or even worse. But there's hurt. There's pain. We have been wronged. And now we, now we find ourselves at that trailhead for vengeance. But what choice are you going to make? What choice are we going to make? Let the Lord take care of it, as the Bible says, or take matters into your own hands. Like what we find here with Samson. Look at verse 3. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. Samson chose to take matters into his own hands. This man, supposed to be set apart to the Lord, dedicated to God, relying on the Lord, he decides to avenge himself. He becomes his own avenger, if you will. And you can just hear the anger and hatred in his words from the hurt he's now having to experience, the hurt he's now having to go through. Because the Philistines, after all, these Philistines are the ones who coerced his bride to betray him. The Philistines are the ones to blame for the hurt and the pain he is having to endure now, and he wants to get even. He doesn't want to sit on the sidelines waiting for the Lord to take care of it. He wants to take care of it now. He wants revenge, and he wants it now. He wants to pay them back, and notice he wants to harm them. He wants to hurt them, which is something we all need to understand, because this is what hurt people do. Hurt people hurt people. Those who have been hurt or have experienced pain, they tend to do the same to others. I know it's not right, but it's something you and I need to understand, you and I need to realize. Some of us have been hurt by others who have been hurt themselves. We have been on the receiving end of it. And maybe some of us have been on the other side of it. We were the ones to hurt others because we were hurting. Even in the church, which is something else we have to understand, we need to realize the church is full of hurting people. We're not perfect, at least not yet. But the church is full of hurting people, people who have been hurt and people who have hurt. I know that does not excuse their actions, but it helps us to understand those around us, those in the body of Christ, and it's something we need to realize. So-and-so did this to me. So-and-so said this to me. So-and-so ignored me. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. So-and-so is going through a lot right now. He or she is hurting, and I'm sorry they treated you that way. They have a lot going on right now, and they are hurting. So please give them a little grace. Listen, we don't always know what someone else is dealing with or going through or has gone through. We don't always have that information. So we need to have a little bit of patience. We need to give them a little bit of grace when we have these encounters. Understanding this person may have been hurt or is hurting, and if so, 
even taking that same position, taking their position instead of throwing stones at them. Flip over to John's Gospel, chapter 8, to the right a little bit. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Look at verse 1. It says, They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a, a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote, his, wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, from, go on from now and sin no more. The Jewish leaders plotted this event. They wanted to find some way to charge Jesus, to come against Jesus, to trap him, and be able to accuse him of wrongdoing so he could be arrested and charged. And so they tricked this woman into committing adultery, so they could come against Jesus and find fault in him. Now, by no means does this excuse a woman's actions. This does not excuse her sin. Jesus even acknowledges it. But these leaders set her up. These leaders tricked her. They took advantage of her. They wronged her. And now they are ready to stone her for something they plotted. For something they organized. And what does Jesus do? He bends down and he joins her. He takes her position. He bends down and he joins her in that place, that place of being wrong, being tricked, being taken advantage of. He takes her position and does not remain standing above her. That holier-than-thou position that we like to do with others. He does not take that kind of a stance. He's not condemning this woman for what she has done as the Jews were, but Jesus takes her position. Oftentimes, that's the position we need to take instead of the one we normally take, standing high above, ready to throw stones. But that's what we tend to do, isn't it? Our feelings get hurt, and then we get upset. We get angry all the while, not understanding that the person on the other side may be hurting. Just going through something. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful. But Samson here back in Judges is upset. He's ready to avenge himself and the hurt he's experiencing. And he's even justifying the hurt and the harm he wants to do. He's justifying the hurt and the harm he is going to do. He says, I'm innocent this time in regards to the Philistines when I do them harm. Right? He acknowledges that he messed up before. But this time, this time he believes he's in the right. This time he believes it's okay. He believes he's in the right for what he's about to do, but that is the kind of reasoning we have when we go down this path. They did this to me, so it's only right. They did this to me, it's only fair that I do this back to them. They hurt me, so I am justified in hurting them. They harm me, so I'm going to harm them. But that's what the world, that's the world's kind of thinking. Right? An eye for an eye or tooth for the tooth, but that's not what Jesus has taught us. That's not what Jesus taught his church. Flip over to Matthew chapter 5, the, to the left, just a little bit. Matthew chapter 5.
And look at verse 38. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus here is talking about our individual conduct. Our natural human tendency to retaliate, to get even. If someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. Don't slap them back. They take your tunic, give them your cloak too. If they force you to walk a mile, go with them two miles. Jesus, Jesus himself would illustrate this for us. After he was arrested and brought before the Jewish, Jewish council where he was interrogated, Right? They slapped him in the face, and they spit on him, but he didn't retaliate. He remained silent. He didn't argue or fight back. They took his clothes, but he never thrashed out in anger. He was taken to Herod to be judged. He was taken to Pilate to be judged, and eventually taken to the cross, where his broken body and beaten body would be nailed to, hanging there in agonizing pain, intense pain, and eventually die. But instead of cursing at them, what does Jesus say? says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. He prays for them. These were his own people. Those were his own people, his own nation who would do this to him. Even his own disciple, Peter, would deny Jesus three times, but the Lord did not retaliate against him. And God did not retaliate against you either. God did not retaliate against us for our sin and rebellion, the hurt we have caused him, but instead he gave us his only son, Jesus Christ, to take our place on that cross. God did not respond to us with anger and hatred for our sin. He responded to us with grace and mercy. Something we will not find in this world. All we will find is the need to get even the need to retaliate, the need to avenge ourselves, and the need to fight fire with fire. And as we said before, when you fight fire with fire, all you're going to do is get a bigger fire. Flip back over to Judges 15, look at verse 4. It says, so Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches, and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain, as well as the olive orchard, orchards. Samson wanted to hit the Philistines where it hurts, in their crops and their food supply. He gathered 300 foxes. Some commentators say they were jackals because jackals would travel in larger packs where foxes kind of travel alone. But he gathers these 300 animals and ties their tails together with a torch in between them and he lights the torch. And he sets them off running in the fields of grain, even the grain that was stacked already and the, even the olive orchards. The foxes or jackals would be running erratically. They would be going crazy because of the fire. And because of the flames of the torch, and they would cause mass destruction, but Samson doesn't care. Samson doesn't care. He wants to hurt these people. He wants to harm these people. He wants them to suffer just as he had suffered. It's like this fiery rage and hate inside of us setting things ablaze, but unfortunately what always seems to happen is that others tend to get hurt too. The innocent tend to pay the price. Look at verse 6. It says, And the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. The Philistines find out who set their crops ablaze. They find out it was Samson, and what do they do? Just as what we would expect. They want to get even. They want to repay Samson for what he has done to them. The Philistines fought fire with fire, literally, but look who was hurt. 
Look who was hurt, who was killed on this path of vengeance. Samson's would-be wife and his father-in-law are consumed in the fires of retaliation. Lives were lost and lives were hurt. What about the father's uh, other daughter? She just lost her family. What about the husband of Samson's bride who, was, who she was given to? He just lost his wife. So not only do people lose their lives, they were killed. Now we have others who have been hurt, who, have, who were caused pain. Did Samson think that was going to happen? Probably not. Do we foresee others being burned or consumed by the fires of our anger and rage towards another? Probably not. Right? We don't always know the collateral damage that could take place, do we? We don't always know, but guess what? They are always there. There is always collateral damage. There is always somebody who's going to get hurt in the crossfire when we take this path of vengeance. The innocent will also have to pay the price for our actions. They will have to deal with the consequences of our choice to make, take matters into our own hands. Others are going to get hurt. That's just a matter of fact. And it's another piece along this path we have to realize and we have to understand. And no, that's not our intention, but something we need to remember. That our actions will come at a great cost. And the two sides, and the two sides still remain unequal. The two sides are not even. Look at verse 7. And it says, And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Atim. Samson finds out that his wife and her father have been killed in the fire set by the Philistines, and what does he do? He wants more vengeance. More revenge against the Philistines for what they have done now. And their hurt, they continue to cause him. This is what Yancey mentioned in that quote we started with. The problem with revenge is that it never gets what it, it, never gets what it wants. It never evens the score. Fairness never comes. The chain reaction set off by every act of vengeance always takes an unhindered course. And Samson swears he will be avenged on the Philistines once again. In other words, this judge swears he will get even. But this is the cycle. This is the path. This is that escalator we talked about. This is that tit for tat, back and forth. It never ends and it never will end. It just keeps going around and around in circles. Samson hurt the Philistines, the Philistines hurt Samson, Samson's ready to hurt the Philistines again. It just keeps going on and on. And much of the wars and disasters, the deep-seated hatred and pain in our world comes from this cycle. It comes from the hands of man and this cycle of retaliation, this cycle of revenge, of trying to get even, trying to even the score, but it never happens. And instead, all we get is more carnage, more destruction, more hurt, and more pain. Samson in his anger wants to avenge himself, and so he strikes again. Samson goes after the Philistines and strikes them hip and thigh. He struck them with a great blow. The expression hip and thigh is meant for a cruel and unsparing slaughter. It was ruthless. It was cruel with no second thought of what this guy was doing. And so this cycle of retaliation continues. As Samson stays on this path of vengeance, we find less and less remorse and more and more devastation, more hatred, more hurt, more pain, more cruelty. We also find more isolation. After his attack, Samson finally stops and goes and hides himself in the cleft of the rock at this place called Atim, meaning this word meaning a lair of wild beasts. But that's exactly how Samson is behaving. That is exactly how Samson is acting. By instinct and rage, emotion, not by logic or wisdom or love. Acting in, he's acting in the flesh like a wild animal. And we now find him alone. 
No more family, no more friends, no more parties. He's isolated. He isolated himself from others because of his anger and rage and the hatred. He is keeping people away instead of letting them in. And it's a sad outcome on this path of vengeance, a sad out outcome for all who take this path. But listen, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to end this way. We can change course. We can get off that escalator. We can take a different path where we will find victory. We'll see that in the coming weeks with Samson because the Philistines are not done yet. They're coming back to repay Samson. Many more are coming back to settle the score. And how will he respond? And how will we respond this next time? How are we to respond when we deal with hurt and pain, when we've been wronged? How will we respond this next time but Samson's going to show us how to. When we pick up in our study next time, we'll see. Samson's going to change the course a little bit. He's going to show us how to respond. He's going to show us how to deal with the hurt, with the pain, with the wrongdoings that we encounter. Right? There's a better response we can have. There's another path we can take than going down this path of vengeance. And we'll look at that in the coming weeks. Let's pray. Father God, again, we just thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for your word just revealing so much to us and helping us to see the dangers of when we take matters into our own hands, when we take this path of vengeance, when we want to retaliate. retaliate. But that's not what you've told us to do. We, you've told us to trust in you. Help us to do that, because it's hard. It's easier said than done. It's hard to do that. So show us, Lord. Reveal to us this better path, and we'll see that next time in your word. But please be with us. Please guide us and continue to minister to us. We thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you continue to do for us. We are so grateful. So go before us, and may we abide with you as you abide with us. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, let's work.